My next speaker is Dr. Natasha Bray, who is speaking on vaporizing, vaping and electronic cigarettes and THC. Dr. Bray is the interim dean of Oklahoma State College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Cherokee Nation campus. Dr. Bray completed her medical degree at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences and is board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. So uh, I think this will be a really a stimulating <laughs> Thing for so we're really looking forward to what you have to tell us. All right, thank you so much. We're going to shift gears a little bit, right? So um, you guys had an excellent, very lots of data um, driven um, presentation. This is going to change a little bit. We're going to talk about some public health policies, um, and you're probably at some point going to get mad at me because you're going to see a lot of youth data. And you're going to be sitting there going, why is she talking to us about kids? We're a bunch of internists. But I'll tell you why as we go through the talk. So our learning objectives are here up the board for interest of time, I'm not gonna go through them all, but really we wanna talk about what's happened from a public policy standpoint and why this is an important topic for us to talk about. The evolution in the landscape of tobacco products, and I think that this is important to kind of understand because what we talked about from public health and the use of cigarettes, 50 years ago versus today looks very different. It's pretty rare to actually see somebody with a combustible cigarette smoking at this point, but it's not unusual to see people walking around with all kinds of different electronic devices. And what they're inhaling is always the question because you don't know what is actually in that device. So I put this up here because it gives us kind of a broad overview of public policy in the rate and number of per capita of cigarettes smoked per year over history. And this starts um, back in 1900. We can trace it through World War I. You see a huge increase with World War II in consumption of cigarettes. And it really peaked around 1964. And that's when the Surgeon General initially released a report saying, hey, there's a lot of health consequences associated with cigarette use and cigarette smoking. And we began to see a downward trend. Now, one of the things that I will put up here is a lot of these downward trends and utilization are directly tied to governmental actions. Um, and probably the biggest one that you can see in 2010, and we're gonna walk through what's happened in the last 12 years um, kind of incrementally. But in 2010, we added a federal tax a 62 cents um, increase per pack of cigarettes. And that's pretty significant when you think about it. And it's actually increased over time. So why does this matter? In 2018, 1.1 billion people smoked and were active current smokers. And I do wanna point out on this slide, this is worldwide data that 942 million males and 175 females. And I want you to keep those numbers kind of in your mind because when we talk about cigarette smoking and we talk about the use of different nicotine-based products, we historically have had a male predominance of the use of these um, of these substances. And as we move through and we talk about some of the newer ways that people are using nicotine-based products, you're gonna see a shift in that. So these are the newest and greatest. There's all kinds of different electronic nicotine delivery systems. And one of the things when you're talking to patients, if you ask them that they smoke, they are thinking in their mind only about combustible cigarettes, the typical pack of cigarettes. They're probably, when they say no, they're not including smokeless tobacco, they are not including cigars. They're not including these electronic devices. So it's really important as you're asking questions to ask specific questions. And when they say yes, they use an electronic or a vape based device, ask them what the substance is within that device. Because a lot of times it is not nicotine. There's a lot of THC inhalation that happens through these products. I put this up here and I told you this is where you were going to be mad at me because I'm going to talk about adolescence, um, but really, really important. And the bottom lines that are kind of grayed out are our typical things that we think about cigarettes, combustible cigarette or combustible cigarettes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, hokas, pipes. What you see on the top is the increase, the black line is any tobacco product that's being used. And what you see really from 2013 to 2020 in youth is that that orange line 
which is your electronic cigarettes. And we'll talk about the different products that are used directly correlates to the total tobacco products. So youth are not smoking typical cigarettes. They're using these electronic delivery devices. So why do I include adolescent data in an internal medicine talk? Two thirds of current smokers began smoking before the age of 20 and 86% before the age of 25. So if we think about our patients that we take care of, our adult patients, they began smoking when they were in their adolescence. And most of our patients have children. So they're modeling behavior. So as we begin to think about this from a public health and from a policy standpoint and how we talk to people, how we counsel them, it's important to understand when that initiation of use is happening. So this is kind of um, an overview of what we're talking about. Um, the graph on the, on the left side of the slide is 2019-2020, and this is among US high school students in the last 30 days. Have they, have they used any nicotine or electronic cigarette-based devices? What you see is we really saw a peak in 2019 with 27.5% of high school students had used e-cigarettes in the past month. One thing that I'll point out that I didn't put the data up here is the number for middle school students, so our sixth through eighth graders, is at 10.8%. We did see a decrease in 2020 down to 19.6, and in 2021 data that for high school students at 11.3%. And we can have some debates on this. I will tell you, um, data collection was truncated in 2020 because of COVID. So they only got about three months of data. This survey on youth behavioral um, use of substance is normally done at schools. So as you can imagine, students are probably gonna be more honest if they're taking this type of survey in a school environment than if they're taking it online in a home environment. In 2021, it shifted where none of those surveys were done in schools. They were all sent out um, via either telephone or electronic based um, survey responses. So we may have a major data dis um, discrepancy here is what I think is important to know. The other thing that's theorized for the drop in these numbers is what happened between 2019 and 2020. All the kids got stuck at home right? We couldn't go anywhere. So their ability to actually go out and get these substances was actually curtailed because they were forced to be at home, probably under a little bit more supervision from their parents, potentially. Another thing that I want to bring to your attention is if we look at, remember when I said worldwide, we have a male predominance of use. This is in the 2020 National Youth Survey data. And look what has happened. When we look at e-cigarette data, 20.4% of females versus 18.7% of males. So what we are seeing is a demographic shift in who is using these types of products. And it's viewed as being glamorous. It's easier to hide. You don't get the bad smelly breath. You don't stink when you use electronic um, delivery devices. So you don't get that smell associated with typical historic smoking. So it's become a more glamorous and a more approachable product by young females. So we are seeing a demographic shift and that's gonna have long-term impact. Remember I said, those who start smoking before the age of 20, two thirds of lifelong smokers started before that age. So it's important data. Again, this is just to drive the, the point home. I've said it over and over. Right now, when we talk about 19.6% in 2020, that's one in five high school students who have used it in the past month. Those that used it in the past month, 25% of them are using it on a daily basis. So a lot of consumption. Um, again, when we look at middle schools, it's one in 10. Really impressive when we think about the age of those children. And 80%, and we'll touch on this a couple of different times, are using a flavored product. So they're not using um, something that tastes bad, right? They're looking for that candy, um, good tasting kind of products. So it's not just our high school students, it's also our college students, if you're curious, and it's college students, and then also our 19 to 22 year olds who are not in college. The data that's on this slide is 2017 versus 2019. And again, you're seeing an increase in use of these products in that age group. Vaping and cannabis, um, I told you it's really important to ask what is being used within those electronic delivery devices. 
cannabis oil has really replaced your typical joints. Most people aren't going out getting dried marijuana leaves, rolling them into joints and smoking them. They're using um, tinctures, which is basically, if you guys know how do you make gin, you take vodka, you put all the herbs in, you let you heat it up um, to activate it, and then you let it set and kind of diffuse in a tincture of marijuana. You take an alcohol-based substance, you heat it up, you put in marijuana leaves, you let it set, and you basically brew it into a tincture. Marijuana leaves have to be heated to activate and release THC. So you'll see it converted into an oil. That oil extraction process is what is used in these vaping based um, devices. It's also, so dabbing is when you get that concentrated THC oil and then it's reduced and it's actually used in a combustion based device. So you actually are heating it at that point. Why do they do that? You get a faster hallucinogenic effect and you raise the THC content of what's actually consumed into the body. Um, we'll come back to Evoli and vitamin E acetate, but tuck that back away. 8.4% of adolescents have vaped cannabis in the last 30 days, and one in three high school seniors vaped cannabis in 2018 alone. If we look at adult data, this is adults. Um, so the, the overall um, cannabis use, it, the light blue is 2017, the dark blue is 2019. So we've seen an increase overall use in society of cannabis. The proportion of users who are vaporizing as their primary method has increased over time. Why this is important, this is data from 2019. If you've driven around the state of Oklahoma and looked at the proliferation of medicinal marijuana availability, I can't imagine what this data looks like today. We've seen a dramatic increase in the people who are using um, marijuana on a daily basis. And if you look at tax data, right? So all the dispensaries have to report their taxes. Um, we are not seeing an increase in Oklahoma in the last two years in the number of people who have their recommendations for their cards essentially, but we are seeing a dramatic increase in tax revenue associated with it. So the same approximate number of people who have their cards, in theory, are using more substance because we've got more tax revenue being generated. So we know that that's going on. So governmental regulation, what has been done in this? So a couple of kind of important things. In, 20, in 2009, the Family Smoking Prevention Tobacco Act was passed. This gave broad um, authority to the FDA to oversee nicotine containing products. So that was kind of the first thing. So they started looking at the data. In 2015, as a sub, this really isn't governmental regulation. 2015, Juul Lab Incorporated um, was established as an entity. It was a pod-based vaping system. And it was really the first one that was out there. And they made their hallmark by selling flavored tobacco-based products. Um, in 2016, the FDA deeming rule, and we'll come back to this, deemed e-cigarette products and all other electronic delivery mechanisms as um, having to register. And they basically, if you were already on the market and you were deemed to kind of fall into what would be considered a nicotine cigarette-like product, you had, and you were out there, you had to apply to the FDA and that had to be done by 2020. So if you were already out there, you had to come back and see it. Any new product that came on the market had to go through an FDA approval process before going on there. In 2017, Juul changed their formulation of their vapes to a salt-based nicotine. What that does is it took that harsh edge off of the nicotine inhalation and made it a much smoother and it changed the blood absorption rate. So now instead of being a little bit slower than combustible cigarettes, you get a, an immediate hit with that initial inhalation of nicotine getting into your system. So why did everybody love Juul? Juul fundamentally changed the conversation about how people were using nicotine. One, it's, it's super tiny, right? So when we talk about adolescents, it's easy to hide. It's battery operated, it's portable, I touched on that you don't smell. They have all these fun flavors like mango, fruit, cream, mint. So you could find that perfect um, taste associated with it. Um, one Juul pod had as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. 
So, and it, it looked cool, right? That was the big thing. It was the cool, hot thing. So what happened? In 2019, in June, we first got uh, case reports of Evoli, and we'll talk about what that is. By, so that was June. By September, the former FDA commissioner came out and said, we have an obligation to act on what we know. And what we know is very disturbing. E kids are using e-cigarettes and it's um, hit an epidemic level of growth. And this is a public health emergency. So what was the fuss about? What is Evoli? Evoli is e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung disease. Really scary. That first case report was in June of 20, um, just messed up, in June of 2019. By February 18th of 2020, there had been 2,807 hospitalizations for Evoli cases and deaths had been reported in all 50 states. There were 68 deaths that were confirmed and contributed to Evoli. So what is it? Well, we had this group of lung diseases and people dying from them. And really the median age was around 50. The people who were being hospitalized were much younger. So the, average, the mean age of the hospitalizations was 24, more males than females. When they started digging in through the case reports and getting an idea, 82% reported using e-cigarette products that contain THC. And 33% of those only use THC related products. 16% of those came from commercial sources. So what are commercial, commercial sources of THC? They're your medicinal dispensaries. 78% of informal sources. So they had someone going to a medicinal dispensary to get it for them and passing it along. In most cases, they were actually modifying pods. So they were, they were taking them, they were making their own tinctures and putting them into that. Um, so a lot of things that were happening there. 57% reported using nicotine containing products and 14% reported exclusively use of nicotine based products. So the question was, what is going on here? What is causing this? They were coming in with cough, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, um, some nausea, vomiting, headache, fatigue, weight loss. And I will tell you, we don't have a lot of case reports since February of 2020. Why? What do these symptoms sound like? COVID, right? So a lot of what potentially could have been attributed to this has probably been lost in the COVID data, or we just don't have, the CDC is still tracking this, but we may just not have the data filtering through to us in a way that we can use it right now. The physical exam had hypoxemia, fever, tachypnea. Um, the, the big thing is, is the screening questions. So do you vape? What have you vaped? How recently have you vaped? Most of the cases were within 30 days, even though the CDC in their data collection looked back 90 days. So chest x-rays, and I'm gonna show you some in the next slide, diffuse bilateral infiltrates, chest CTs, not specific, but bilateral ground glass opacities. One of the interesting things is there's subpleural sparing, and you can see it on the next CT that I will show you. Really interesting, what does this sound like? COVID, right? So again, when we talk about the lack of data from February 2020 forward, it's really hard to disaggregate what happened there. So we may, we may have a gap in our knowledge related to how common this is and are we still seeing it? So these are some, the top two are chest x-rays. The difference between um, the A and the B is 12 hours and a 20 year old male who came in with, with this presentation. His CT is down below. And what you'll notice is that diffuse pattern, uh, that ground glass pattern diffuse infiltrates throughout. And you really can on that bottom one, see how you've got that subpleural sparing. So it tends to go more towards your inferior lobes in central location, a little bit less so towards the periphery. Again, these are four different patients. Um, so diffuse interstitial type patterns. We've got ground glass, we've got nodularities in some patients. So a variety of presentations on their imaging. When we look at the lungs on autopsy, one of the things that you'll notice is a predominance of macrophages within there. So you, you will see um, kind of fibrotic changes um, and you see a predominance of macrophages within the alveolar space, but diffuse alveolar destruction. 
So one of the theories, every patient that they did a bronchial lavage on who was diagnosed with EVALI was found to have vitamin E acetate within their plural, within their um, lavage samples. And the thought is, is that this may have contributed at least to the pathology of this. Vitamin E is used as a thickening agent in THC um, based liquid preparations so that it actually will vaporize more completely. It is thought that um, the vitamin E acetate is basically acting as an inflammatory um, agent within the lungs itself and maybe triggering this with the exposure then of continued vaping products. So what do you see and how do you handle this? It's really hard, right? It's a non-specific thing. It's really driven by that history of a vape or e-cigarettes based product. So you, you need to get pulmonary and toxicology involved. Um, and I will tell you, this is something that we are continuing to actively monitoring. So reporting to poison control, which is not something we do a lot. And if they have vaping cartridges for what their usual product is, collecting those and getting those to the CDC, they're analyzing those. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But we want to, uh, to symptomatically manage these patients. So if they need to go on, on um, a breathing machine, get them intubated and get them ventilatory support. Most of these patients do get antibiotics initially for that initial 48 hours. And the reason is, is you just don't know what that underlying, I don't know how to make that go away, um, that underlying um, etiology is. If it's influenza season, you know, we can, we can do our respiratory panels and rule that out, but think about it. Same thing with COVID, um, make sure that that has been ruled out. Those have been ruled out. Most of these patients improve with systemic steroids. And the question is how much and for how long? And I will tell you that the literature is not clear on that. Generally it's high dose and they tend to be on it for a long time because we're talking about a hypersensitivity, inflammatory, interstitial lung type pattern of injury that is happening there. Um, so really important to follow these and really important to report if you have a suspected case, because this is something we need to follow. So what happened as a response to this? We declared a public health emergency. We have all these kids getting hospitalized. We have people dying. We don't know what's going, but we know there's a link to electronic cigarette use. Juul voluntarily in October of 2019 stopped selling online. I mean, just think about that for a moment. Online flavored nicotine-based products. They pulled mango, they pulled cream, they pulled fruit. Um, they left mint, menthol, and the normal nicotine flavor. In November, they pulled mint. There was a huge public outlash about the continued use of mint. By April of 2020, the uh, Federal Trade Commission had actually filed administrative complaints against Ultra and Juul Labs. So Ultra um, is the parent company of Philip Morris. And they had bought um, back in 2018 when Juul sales were going through the roof, they bought a 35% share of Juul Labs and started marketing it. And so there were all kinds of FT. FTC complaints and concerns about antitrust and what is happening there. So go forward. Remember how I told you um, about the deeming rule, right? We pulled all the yummy flavors of jewel-based products. What happened? The market responded, right? Huge loophole in the law. You can't sell pod-based vaping materials that are flavored. So what happened? We see a massive increase in single use e-cigarette products. So e-cigarette products are not, they're not pod based, right? They're not flavored. They're a single cigarette. You can go into QT and buy them today. They're a single use product. So what happened from February of 2020 to March of 2021, e-cigarette sales increased by 50% went from 14.8 million units to 22 million units. Guess what it was driven by? Kid-friendly flavors. There's cotton candy, there's mango, there's all, every fruit flavor you can come up with. There's birthday cake. And so we see all of these flavors really being pushed um, and it's out there. So sale of disposable e-cigarettes increased by 200%, really amazing. 
menthol flavored e-cigarettes also went up a lot. Um, so remember I said, you can still get the pods in menthol and in just unflavored. And they're not very popular. In September of 2020, the FDA says, we're gonna prioritize the enforcement of this. Something has to be done. Sales of, of disposables have doubled. This is a huge problem. March, 2021, menthol e-cigarettes account for 41% of the e-cigarette market. Huge problem. This is, you can't read this. Don't worry about it. If you wanna look at it on your screens, you can. The reason this is up here is to tell you um, what, what is the number one thing kids love. And I put it up here more so you understand. The most popular brand among high school students at this point is called Puff Bar, right? So, I mean, the marketing of this is very, very much targeted to young kids. So we had the, the Evoli, we had a public health emergency, we can't sell flavored pods. Now it's been flooded and replaced by eat flavored single use e-cigarettes. FTC says big problem. That deeming rule back in 2016 said by 2020, everyone has to register and apply for um, approval to be able to continue to sell these products. So by September of 2020, that was the drop date date, between September of 2020 and September of 2021, the FDA uh, um, reviewed pre-marketing materials for about 500 companies. And um, there were 296 denials issued for close to 1.1 million individually flavored electronic nicotine delivery systems. So important to know, October 12th of 2021, one was approved. So the FDA granted permission to RJ Reynolds to market its Buse Solo closed end system into a company flavored e-liquid pods. They're menthol and nicotine flavored. Um, they have a nicotine strength of 4.8%. 10 other flavors were denied. So they tried to go the massive flavored nicotine route. And the quotes that are on here were the, the exact quotes that were in the products. So the authorized products aerosols are significantly less toxic than combusted cigarettes based on the available data. And for these products, the FDA has determined that the potential benefit to smokers who switch completely or significantly reduce their cigarette use would outweigh the risk to youth provided the applicant follows post-marketing requirements aimed at reducing youth smoking. So, Here's the question. Are e-cigarettes safer than combustible tobacco products? Can we use them in a harm reduction strategy? Remember that nicotine, when we're talking about nicotine, has primary effects on the heart, predominantly on our cardiovascular system. It raises blood pressure. It contributes to atherosclerotic disease. It causes bronchospasm in our pulmonary system. Nicotine itself, has adverse health effects. So that's the first thing. They both have nicotine. Arguably, your electronic delivery systems, patients end up with a higher nicotine load than they do with combustible cigarettes. Other thing to keep in mind is what is in that liquid itself. So you've got propylene glycol, you have glycerin, you have nicotine flavorings, all kinds of other things that are in there. Remember that vitamin E that was tied to Evoli is in these electronic cigarettes. You've got wires, atomizers, fiberglass wicks um, that are in there. The all kinds of things are coming into the body. So we know that cigarettes, you know, that number that's thrown out there, there's more than 7,000 chemicals in cigarettes. Well, when mass spectrometry analysis has been done on e-cigarettes, there were more than 2,000 chemicals in them. Most of them can't be identified yet. So we really don't know what's there. Of the ones that have been identified, one of the things that's interesting, 60% of e-cigarettes um, that were tested had caffeine in them. The thought is, is that caffeine gives people a little bit of a jolt, right? They're inhaling it, it's increasing absorption of the nicotine, it's boosting the thing that's there. All kinds of things potentially there that we don't know. And you also have to remember that we're heating. There's a heating mechanism that's happening to these chemicals as it passes across a filter. So again, what is happening? All kinds of health-related effects that have been, have been um, associated with e-cigarette use. 
whether we're talking about EVALI, but even not EVALI, when we think about pulmonary, there's inhalation injuries, there's hypersensitivity pneumonitis, there's increased um, acute eosinophilic pneumonias associated with it. So you can read all of those yourself, but there are real dangers associated with this. Um, there, the carbonyl compounds are one of the things that we really worry about from a cancer causing. Now you can look on the top. I don't know if you guys can read it. I may not have made it big enough. The e-cigarettes versus conventional cigarettes. Um, there are lower levels of formaldehyde, acetaldehyde within e-cigarettes, but it is still there. So we're not eliminating it completely. Long-term health effects, we really don't know. At the end of the day, to, with the data that we have and the studies have been done, we really don't know what the long-term health effects are going to be. There's evidence that completely switching, so they never pick up a combustible cigarette again, um, reduces exposures to toxicants and carcinogens. And so if you read the FDA, it says those who completely switch from smoking cigarettes to the use of e-cigarette products, it probably does support a harm reduction. However, we don't know what's happening with those ultra fine particulates that are generated by an aerosolization process and how they deposit within the lungs. The other concern, and it's on the next slide, so I'll put it up there, I love this study. Um, they looked at what is happening with those little tiny corrosive metacoils that are heating the pod-based chemicals um, and the, the, the liquid chemicals as they pass across to create the ventilization. And what they found is those little bitty coils are leaching all kinds of heavy metals into what is being vaporized and being inhaled into the lungs. They've documented lead, chromium, nickel, magnesium, and zinc. So not things that you necessarily would want to be making into ultra um, small particles and breathing in to deposit into your lung tissue. So um, consensus statement um, from the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine, initiation and cessation. There is conclusive evidence that nicotine itself and most e-cigarette products have and emit potentially toxic substances. We can say that with confidence. So does the use of e-cigarettes lead to lifelong tobacco addiction? That was the other thing, right? Totally different things. We don't have to worry about tobacco addiction. Um, I, told you I wouldn't have as many studies, but I do think it's important to look at some of the meta analysis that are out there. So association between electronic nicotine delivery systems and electronic non-nicotine delivery systems with initiation of analog. So um, the hip term for traditional combustible cigarettes is they're analog because they're not electronic um, with analog uh, cigarette use in people under the age of 20, what do they find? there's a 3.09, 3.01 odds ratio that they're gonna actually smoke cigarettes at some point. So they're gonna transition. So there is substantial evidence that e-cigarettes use increased risk of ever using combustible tobacco products among youth who start using it. They're gonna transition over the course of their use. Why is that? Youth brains are still developing. And that is really, really important. When we talk about adolescence, and we all know this, they have not fully formed their prefrontal cortex. So all of those pathways that are involved in the development of addiction, that are involved in the development of lifelong substance use and our reward pathways are still being formed. So if we're giving them a substance that we know is going to interfere with that, they are extremely vulnerable to that. So what happens? So the traditional cigarettes are in green, or excuse me, traditional cigarettes are in blue. The new generation e-cigarettes are in green and the first generation e-cigarettes are in red. And what you see is the nicotine blood levels get so much higher with e-cigarettes. So we're actually exposing them to even more nicotine. So when we talk about those reward pathways, we're just further reinforcing them. In the interest of time, I am not going to go into the details of this slide, but really the difference in the, is the pathways in the prefrontal cortex with adolescents versus adults and then the nuclear um, accumbens. Remember, our prefrontal cortex is our executive functioning. It's our planning. And we are really at a very formative age. There are, they are reinforcing 
those pathways and that they need that substance. So it's a very dangerous time. Are e-cigarettes as are, are they effective as a smoking cessation, right? For the view solo, that was what they said. Maybe they can help people stop smoking. That was the, the hope. There's a great study in the New England Journal in 2019 that supported this. Among participants with one-year abstinence, those who used e-cigarettes were more likely than those who are on nicotine replacement um, therapy that we traditionally think um, to actually stop smoking. So there was some good evidence of it. So what do we find? We need a meta-analysis. We look at a whole bunch of studies. This was um, 64 papers were examined, 55 observational, nine randomized control studies. And what did they find? Is consumer-driven electronic cigarettes basically don't work. These studies were all over the place when they, when they did the meta-analysis. There is no evidence to support a consumer-based consumption of e-cigarettes as being used as a stop smoking. Now I keep saying consumer-based because a few of the randomized trials actually had good results, but they were in a structured program where they had direct supervision of the use of transitioning from smoking cigarettes and using an electronic cigarette device where it was, it was closely titrated to wean off of nicotine. And those studies did show some benefit, but that's not how it's marketed. That's not how it's being put out. It was a very controlled study. So there's lots of other injuries we didn't talk about. There's burns. These, they all have little battery packs. They can either plug into USBs or you put batteries in them. They blow up. There's lots of burns that have been reported. Also remember we're talking about a liquid. So what do kids, when they find liquids in the house do? they consume them. So they drink them. I told you a lot of the patients who reported with Evoli had actually modified their e-cigarettes, their vaping devices. So they're home modifying and making their own um, that all of these substances can absorb through the skin. So there's toxicity associated if they get spilled in those types of things with chemical reactions. So other things just to remember, um, tobacco use is more prominent in our patients who have mental illness. If we look at adults with mental illness or other substance use disorders, um, there's a higher prevalence of nicotine use in those patients. 34.6% of adults with a mental illness currently use tobacco compared to 23.3% without a diagnosis of, of a mental health disorder. And so if we think about that and we put it in perspective, um, of our patients who, you, who have mental illness who are using cigarettes, they actually consume 40% of all the cigarettes smoked. So they have, not only are they use, more likely to use a nicotine, excuse me, a nicotine product, but they use higher levels of it. So it's important to keep in mind. Other kind of substance use, concomitant use, um, patients who have substance use disorder and use tobacco, um, probably the biggest one that you will see on there is alcohol. Um, so we see co-substance um, use disorders with tobacco and alcohol. 43.5% of adults who smoke also binge drink in the last month. Um, and 14% of report heavy drinking in the last month. So it's just something from a screening and a counseling standpoint to be aware of so that you're able to counsel patients appropriately, which is what we're gonna talk about as the last part. So screening and counseling, e-cigarette terminology is really important. They will refer to this as all kinds of things. And especially if you're talking to younger patients, really, really important. So ADL, if you hear them use that, that is a, a e-cigarette or a vape substance that you can vape all day long, ADL. Um, they will talk about Nick Salt. Nick Salt versus Nick Base is the base of what is going into the nicotine products. If you're gonna cloud chase, you want a Nick Base, not a Nick Salt, because you get a better aerosolization and you get more of a cloud associated with it. That's different than if you want to ghost. So if you want a ghost, you want a low, um, you want a low cloud. So those are the people who are walking around who are inhaling. It's more of a micro particulate. So it's not actually when you breathe out, you don't get that puff of smoke. So it's much less conspicuous. So if you're a young person, you don't want your parents to know what you're doing. A USB charge looks like a USB stick um, device that you have actually modified to remove the safety features of it, you, then you can use it to ghost. And that would be more with a nicotine salt because it has to do with the particulate size as it passes through the device. 
Um, you know, ends we talk about those are electronic nicotine delivery systems. People eat juice, they eat hoka, they're flavor chasing. So that's um, more flavored based products. It's crazy. Um, this is not all of them. And I had a lot of fun actually putting this together because I learned all kinds of squonking is if you take a modified device, you remove the safety feature that limits the amount that comes with it, each inhalation and you use a nicotine-based salt, you can actually change the amount of nicotine absorption that comes across so you can get a faster high um, in absorption of the nicotine. So cigarette advertising, I put this out there because it's important how we as society view and talk about things has changed. So we banned advertising of cigarettes, right? You can't have these wonderful, um, flashy, glamorous um, pictures anymore for traditional tobacco. So when Juul came on the market, it was all over social media. And it was, I mean, look at the similarity of the pictures in the marketing. It's the pretty young, hip, healthy looking people who are selling this. Um, the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act of 1969 said, mm -mm, can't do it. And guess what? Juul got in trouble for their fancy um, social media uh, campaign. So when we talk to people, when we talk to parents, when we talk to patients, tobacco use among youth and young people in, in any form, including e-cigarettes is not safe. I mean, it's a pretty clear message. Nicotine is very common in e-cigarettes. And I put this up here because if you talk to young people and I'm talking even into their twenties and thirties, they don't know that there's actually nicotine in those. They're vaping it because it's a flavor product and it tastes good and they, they like the jitteriness that they get from it. They don't know that there's nicotine in that. Um, nicotine can harm the developing adolescent brain. Remember our brain, especially our prefrontal cortex is developing until the age of 25. So really important when we're talking about developing lifelong substance use disorders and how our brain thinks about that dopaminergic system and our reward pathway. We really, really need to look at that. And remember I said 85 to 89% of people who are lifelong smokers started before the age of 25. So it really tells you how important that is. Nicotine can cause addiction. Don't you love these simple statements? How often do we actually use very clear messaging? Scientists are still learning about the long-term health effects of these cigarettes. We don't know what they are. Some of the ingredients could be really harmful to the lungs, long-term exposure. Point of care actions, you know, we all talk about the five A's. Ask, do they use tobacco in any form? If, they're va if they say, yes, I vape, what are you vaping? Do you only vape nicotine-based products? Or are you also vaping THC-based products? Advise tobacco users to quit, assess readiness for quit, assist in a quit attempt, and arrange for follow-up care. Really important. It makes a difference. Um, other things, defective e-cigarette batteries cause fires and explosions. Poisonings have occurred, um, especially if they're small children in the home, really important to talk about. In e-cigarettes and vaping, both nicotine and THC is linked to evolving. Now you're gonna to have to explain what Evoli is, but it is a rapid deteriorating pulmonary disease that can result in, in death in young people very quickly. So there are FDA approved medications. I'm a huge fan of medication assisted therapy. I told you why I don't think that e-cigarettes should be used as a cessation device, but there are medications that work really well. Nicotine replacement therapy. So remember patches, you put them on, they stay on for a period of time. If you have patients who have nightmares, have them take it off at night um, so that they actually can get into a REM sleep, but you get a continuous nicotine delivery with it. Um, I like to use patches and I like to recommend then gum. Tell your patients how to use nicotine gum. It is not, you know, bubblicious where you set and blow bubbles with it. You are gonna chew it, it is until it gets soft and your mouth starts feeling tingly you need to park it against a mucous membrane, either your cheek or under your tongue. You'll get a minty flavor that releases when that flavor goes away. You need the nicotine absorption through a mucous membrane. You start chewing the gum again until your mouth gets tingly and then you park the gum again. You will get rapid onset. So if we've got a patch on with a steady nicotine level and then we use the gum for those cravings, I need a cigarette right now, you get good response. Um, the graph that is here, has the response on different things. So the absorption um, on the yellow line, that's how fast a smoked cigarette gets in. The fast, next fastest is actually your gum. 
So that, that chewing and parking, really important. We also have nasal sprays, there's inhalers, and um, then the nasal sprays and the inhalers are by prescription only. So work with your patients and find something that works for them. These are my references. I am happy to answer any questions that you have. I think I managed to stay under time. E-cigarettes now are most common, really important. There's substantial risk, screen all patients and educate patients and families about the risk because they think that they are safe. And it's really important that we have these conversations. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Floor's open, anybody can ask questions. Any online? Everybody wants ready to go eat lunch. So I yeah. And I'm sorry I'm standing over here. I, after our migraine lecture this morning, I didn't want that light in my eye. Do you have anything against the lozenges? I don't. I think they work well as also. I think they taste bad. Okay. Um, a lot of patients that I've had with the lozenges, you get a lot of um, spit production. And so then they swallow it. And so they're swallowing a lot of nicotine into the stomach. And I have a lot of patients that complain of GI upset. They get nauseous with it. Um, so that's why I like the gum a little bit better. It just seems to be tolerated a little bit better. Yes, sir. In the beginning of your lecture, you talked about the transition of smoking habits between mostly men to then mostly women. And this is a similar pattern that's used in the oncology world with lung cancer. So with, with your studies here, have you noticed more patterns of specific types or subtypes of cancer that have been? So um, I can't answer that. And a lot of it is driven by we don't know. So as we start seeing increased reliance on these e-cigarettes, um, as opposed to combustible cigarettes. I mean, a lot of the theory around cancer was that it was driven by inhaling a burning substance, any burning substance into the lungs that was then causing cellular injury. What we know when we look at use of the, the um, electronic devices, whether it's a vape or an e-cigarette, whatever it is, where we're getting a, a finite, finer particle being inhaled, the question becomes, is, is the cancer, what is that cancer risk going to look like? Um, you know, we saw with Evoli this kind of subplural sparing. So it makes you think that it's going to be a shift more towards a centrally located cancer associated with it. We don't know. Um, I mean, really, these devices have only been on the market since 2015, 2016. Um, the difference in jewel sales of units from 2006. Uh, 17 to two, or 2016 to 2017 was like 2 million units to 28 million units. So the number and availability in, in, we're talking about youth, right? So when you think about the cancers in 20 to 30 years to potentially start to see that, it's going to be 2050 before we potentially start seeing that bear out. And so I don't know where we'll be. You know, I think it's, I think the change in male and female predominance is gonna be really interesting because we've seen that with alcohol, right? We saw where traditionally women did not drink as much. And we saw a, a couple of studies published two or three years ago saying, you know, our highest rate of dying from alcohol associated diseases are in females in that 45 to 55 age group, because now all of a sudden we've normalized what is really hot, heavy alcohol use among the mommy population. Um, and if you look at the social media around that, you know, everybody has their mommy juice and they have their wine glass that holds a whole bottle and, and those types of things. So the amount of alcohol consumption has changed. And I think we're seeing that same trend um, with the use of these nicotine-based products. It is not unusual for someone, I told you a pod is um, the same amount as a pack of cigarettes. Think how hard it is physically to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, right? Just in the burn time of, of actually burning through those cigarettes. You don't see a lot of people who smoke more than two packs a day because that is basically a burning cigarette in your hand at all time. Well, that's two pods. Someone who's vaping all day long, it's not unusual for them to go through four or five pods. So the potential consumption associated with a higher blood levels, we don't know. What else? Yes, sir. We're seeing more Cyclic yeah. So he said we're seeing more cyclic vomiting. We're seeing more cyclic vomiting with associated weight loss in young people. And usually they come in with their moms, and the mom is more concerned about the weight loss. The kid doesn't really see a big problem. But when we ask them about marijuana use, vaping, 
we're getting a lot of positive responses and we need to really try and get that stemmed before it becomes even more of a significant problem. So you're gonna hear my public health response. I think we have a real problem. Um, I think we've kind of taken, um, let the genie out of the bottle um, in a sense with our normalization of marijuana. Um, and I think, I think it's a problem. And, and I can't tell you that there's not patients who benefit from medicinal marijuana. I don't know that. And I don't know the literature. What I think we can say is, especially in those under the age of 25, there is a clear association of marijuana use with, um, with psychosis, with lifelong mental health issues associated with its use, especially as we increase exposure and we increase frequency of use. Um, and I think that as it becomes more accepted, you're seeing that. You're seeing people who their parents use it and so they don't see an issue with people with developing brains using it. And I think, I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be a major issue for all of us to do as that cohort of adolescents um, further develop and become adults. Um, and I, I'm very scared for the long-term health impacts, both from a mental health standpoint, but also we know it's associated with GI issues. We know it's associated with accelerated cardiovascular issues. We know people who use um, the, the tinctures and the um, liquid-based developments where they're, they're vaping it, essentially. We know that that is causing immunologic changes within their system. Those are short-term things that have been measured and shown in studies. And so what does that mean for their long-term health and life expectancy? Two quick things from the virtual uh, yes, audience. Sir. Um, one, have you seen, I don't know that I have, but any enterprising people figured out to calculate pack years with the e-cigarettes um, to have some level of understanding of uh, cancer risk. And then, and then two, um, several questions about ancillary treatments besides nicotine replacement or butrin, Chantix, your just personal approach. Yeah, so let's start with the, I have not seen some magic estimate of pack year equivalents. Um, and I, I really don't know how you would do it because the disposable e-cigarettes, the amounts in them, um, I told you the Buse Solo is 4.8% nicotine. Um, so I think they come in a two pack that that's equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. So, you know, I think you have to kind of do some fancy math back to try to get an estimate, but I think I, how I document it is what they tell me. So I, I try to just document that it's daily use, um, you know, approximately how much they're using per day and of what, of what substance. Um, so that we have some tracking mechanism. Um, the second question related to other, I am a, I'm a huge fan and I think you have to talk to your, your patients, whether it's Wellbutrin or, or Chantix. Um, and I apologize for using the brand name. Um, I, think, I think they work very well. Um, and I think you have to personalize treatment to the patients. Um, and that's, that's very important. Um, if you have patients who um, have a history of depression, um, you have a history of anxiety, are worried about, um, about weight gain. Um, I tend to go towards Wellbutrin and it doesn't negate those completely. Um, I tell patients, none of these medications and, you know, Chantix, when it first came out, it was like, they're not going to want to smoke. I haven't met the patient who doesn't want to smoke. Um, if they, if they have that, because there's so much behavioral tied to it that's outside of just the nicotine addiction. So there's behavior, they get up in the morning and that's the first thing that they do. Going outside in the middle of a stressful day gives them a break from their day and they're able to calm and recenter and focus. So there's behavioral reinforcement that's associated with this that's, that's beyond whether or not they have nicotine in their system. So I think you have to talk to the patients about what their needs are. Um, you know, Chantix can be associated with um, really severe, crazy nightmares. Um, so important to know um, and talk to them. Both when you're, when you're initiating, you need to have a conversation. These medications are gonna help decrease your craving. They don't take it to zero. 
and the big thing that I would encourage you is use combination therapy. They are still, again, even with these medications, it's decreasing craving. They're still going to have cravings. So whether it's a lozenge, it's a gum, whatever it is, give them something that in that moment that they can use. The other thing that I think is really, really important is this is, this is a medical condition at the point that they have a use disorder because of this. Um, they have a, a chronic medical condition. And in the same way, if we have a diabetic patient who eats a donut, we're not guilting them into killing themselves. If we have a patient who has a tobacco use disorder and they smoke a cigarette, they don't have to go back to being a smoker, right? They smoked a cigarette, they had a bad day. So I think framing that for patients is really important because otherwise they don't want to talk to you about the struggle that they're having. We all have bad days. We all do things for us that's not in the best interest of our health. I love my diet, Dr. Pepper, with my artificial sweetener, right? So it's terrible for you. I shouldn't drink that, um, but I like it. So we all do things every day that's not in the best interest of our, of our health. So giving patients permission to, you know what, most likely you're going to have a bad day and you're going to smoke a cigarette or you're going to take a hit off your vape. That doesn't mean that you're a daily user again. That means you had a bad day um, and you get up tomorrow and you work for tomorrow to be a better day. And I think that that's important regardless of what substance we're talking about. It really um, shows them that you're their partner to support them in what is really a difficult disease to manage. Anything else, Dr. Cronister? All right, thank you all so much.